Welcome to a special replay of a You Were the Best classic interview from the Satellite Sisters Archive. Over the holidays, we're sharing four of our all-time favorites, Nora Ephron, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Roz Chast, and Robin Roberts. We'll be back with our first episode of 2023 on Tuesday, January 10th. In the meantime, enjoy. We're the Satellite Sisters. We're the Satellite Sisters. I'm Sheila Dolan here with my sisters, Liz, Leon, and Julie. Monica Dolan is in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to Your the Best Encore Interviews from the Satellite Sisters. J.J. Abrams is with us. J.J., thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. You know okay. Tina Brown. She's an award-winning journalist. Tina, welcome to Satellite Sisters. I'm so thrilled to be with you guys. Oh, we love this book. Robin Roberts, we're so thrilled to have you here on Satellite Sisters. Welcome to the show. You know, Liz, my sister would have busted me like that, too. <laughs> welcome to Your the Best. Encore interviews. Encore interviews from the Satellite Sisters. From the Satellite Sisters. In 2006, we had the pleasure of talking to one of our Satellite Sister all time greats, Nora Ephron. I'm Leanne Dolan. I'm here with my sisters, Julie Dolan and Liz Dolan. And in a few minutes, you'll hear that conversation with Nora Ephron, which I have to say, sisters, when I re- listen to it, it, it brought me to tears. I mm-hmm. was sobbing at the end of this interview. I mean, it's just. Such a poignant, funny, classically Nora conversation. And at the time, we didn't know that in a few years we would lose one of the great female writers, American writers of all time. And Mm -hmm. so just listening to it, I was just stunned by what she says, particularly at the end of the interview about aging and growing old. Stunned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about Nora Ephron way more than you would think. (laughs) And uh, this is Liz. And this conversation is about aging. And she jokes a lot about maintenance and keeping yourself together and the time and effort that we put into that. Wasn't the title of her book, I Feel Bad About My Neck? Yes. 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 So that that still makes me laugh every single time. (laughs) And at the time, Julie, I'm not, I mean, I got the joke, but I didn't feel the joke. Now I feel it. I feel it in my bones, Nora. I think of you every time I look in the mirror. I feel bad about my neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I remember about this interview, though, was, you know, when, when you do talk to a big star like Nora Ephron, I mean, she, you know, there is a tendency to get really nervous and to, you know, uh, and to maybe to hold back. But she, if you listen to how, like, she just wanted to be with the girls, right? She right. just wanted to be with us and have fun with us and, you know, just sort of riff on aging and take, you know, uh, take up our issue, you know, our issues, our worries, our concerns. She was the ultimate girlfriend, wasn't yeah, she? Mm-hmm. I agree. And, and she's also one of the rare people who can be wickedly funny and wickedly insightful at the same time, you know. So, and, and you're right, Julie, we were nervous. I mean, she is really a great hero of mine. I was so nervous to talk to her, and right away she put us at ease. And um, I think that shines through. You're right. I, and that's why I think, Liz, I still miss her every day. I can't believe that she's gone. She, you know, died very quickly. It was, she didn't tell a lot of people. So it, right, it was kind of mysterious. It was so. mysterious and sudden. And so listening back at this interview, given all that, I, I just found it, you know, an extraordinary piece of audio. I'm so glad that we still have this and that we can share it with our Satellite Sisters listeners. So uh, if you have not heard this, you're in for a treat. Um, but if you have, you know, listen again and listen closely because Nora Ephron always has something to say. This This is our conversation with Nora Ephron from 2006. I'm Sheila Dolan here with my sisters, Liz, Leon, and Julie. And Leon, I'm so glad Nora Ephron is here because I want to ask her about the new anti-slackening cream (laughs) that I've been using. And what is slackening? You know, this is a question. I think Nora Ephron can tell you because as part of our Satellite Sisters Radio Book Club, we have picked her fantastic book of essays called I Feel Bad About My Neck. And other thoughts on being a woman. And Nora, you make us feel good about feeling bad. And that's amazing. <laughs> How did the anti slackening cream work? So far, so good. 48 hours. How do I look, ladies? Oh, uh, well, that's the thing about those creams is that they all work for 48 hours. Oh. And then they slacken? Well, <laughs> yes. It's like call me after 96 because, because that's, it's one of those amazing things about those creams. And it's the reason why we, 
we sort of fall for them every single time. Oh, the 48-hour rule. I have yeah. to remember that. Yeah, I hope it didn't cost you too much. No, 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 Nora. It's all under $30. I will never buy oh, a cream. Oh, that's good. Okay, so that's my that's my policy. That's good. Yeah, It's the one that Diane Keaton is doing the ads for, which are cute ads, so we fell for that. I, that, I, I understand that. Yeah, you can say <laughs> why. You know, Nora, I thought we were supposed to feel good about our necks. Like, isn't 60 the new 40 and 40 is the new 12 or what? It I, depends. Or, it depends. It depends if you're totally gullible, then you can believe that, right? <laughs> I mean, there's no question. There's no question. We all look much better than previous generations do for all the obvious reasons. We take good care of ourselves, and let's not forget we all dye our hair, yes, yes. which is an unbelievable anti-aging thing. <laughs> and we've discovered all these fantastic things to do, like bangs, which cover if you're if you're if you let them grow almost a quarter of your face. <laughs> saving the, th- you. the thing about bangs, though, Nora, this is Liz. I was thinking, when you have bangs, it's so obviously an anti-aging <laughs> strategy <laughs> that does it. Could it possibly have the reverse effect on people where they're thinking, "Whoa, what is she hiding under those I, bangs?" Maybe, but meanwhile, you don't have to spend any money injecting things into your forehead. That oh, is yeah. so true. You know. And the other day, I was watching CNN, which is a sort of pioneer in some of these things, as far as the anchor women go and Paula Zahn Mm -hmm. is now wearing her hair it's cut right to the collarbone (laughs) and she takes each side and puts it under her chin Mm -hmm. so her hair now works (laughs) as a turtleneck (laughs) and I thought well this is good Ah, we could do that. Feeling, you know? <laughs> because but, really one of your big positions is women can never have too many black turtlenecks. Yes, you can't have too many black turtlenecks. But but the, the thing I feel, the reason I wrote this book is that I felt that I was reading so much stuff that had no correspondence whatsoever to the actual emotional experience of being in your 50s and 60s. That That so many of these books keep saying things like life is so great and you're in your prime and and you have you, you know the greatest sex of your life and you're going what, what? Yeah, we had that book on we had gail sheehy on we had well, gail and i, mean, I was like gail i don't want to talk about this she's crazy okay. <laughs> you're and just I not buying into the power of the postmenopausal woman well i do think that there are things that you are very powerful about i do think that one knows a whole lot when you get older Unfortunately, you remember so much less, so yeah. it's a kind of wash. <laughs> but but there is no question there are things, if your health is good, uh-huh. that um, and that's a big if, and if your friend's health is good, which, you know, I mean, somebody's health isn't going to be good. Right. That's, right. The, that's the fact. That's an overriding fact. And so I just don't know. I, you know, I sort of began mounting up these things and thinking, is somebody going to write about this, about how complicated and and confusing it is? So then I did. Well, we're glad it was you, because at least you can make us laugh at it, Nora. Thank it's you. Not... Thank you. <laughs> All right, Nora, this is Leanne. I'm 41, and I know there's... Oh, 41, you are nothing. No, I know. That's why I'm asking <laughs> you. Have you have one more year. Show. You have one to two more years before you catch a bad glimpse of your neck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. What should I be appreciating now that maybe I'm not? You Everything, know? from oh. the tips of your toes to the top of your head. <laughs> okay. Everything will go. All right. Everything. And, and <laughs> by the way, turn around and take a look at your elbows. Okay. Because it may be the last look you ever have at them. It's just we're very lucky our elbows don't face forward or we would really be depressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I'm not kidding. The when I hear people, when I hear those young women go, Oh, I'm gonna be thirty or oh I'm gonna be forty, I just wanna go. You are so lucky. Just look in the mirror because Soon you won't. Soon you will pass a mirror and your 
right hand will involuntarily fly up to your face to just ward the sight of yourself <laughs> off. <laughs> but you spend, you write in the book uh, one of the best essays. Well, they're all fantastic, but the one on maintenance. I mean, you, you calculate now you're spending about eight hours a week to look about eight days younger. Isn't yes. that, is that well, the Well, now, gr- of course, I just want to say in my defense, not that you have attacked me. No. I- yet, <laughs> but I attacked myself. But I do want to say that some of that includes exercise. Okay. The unbelievable unbelievably dreary three plus hours of exercise I spend a week most which is you know some of the time bound to do something that will end me up in the hospital (laughs) but but that does include that and it does include hair dyeing the world's most boring maintenance thing which is amortized out over the year and each week adds some time to to some of that but yes i would say eight hours if you count all the awful things we have to do like your like your nails and your toes your unbelievably boring toes and 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 the hair but do we have to do that do you think it's just do we have to do that well, I don't think anyone has to wash their hair quite as much as they do. I think if everybody <laughs> washed their hair one time less a week, it probably wouldn't make the remotest difference. But but we all seem to do it. And by the way, this is not an age-linked thing because young women are into maintenance things that, thank God, I managed to skip like these bikini things that make you look like you've got topiary on your skin. <laughs> yeah. oh, the bikini wax, Liam, you experimented with that earlier oh, in the summer. I don't have to talk about she that. She doesn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but it is hard to maintain. It's a time suck. I mean, for goodness sakes, who's got that time? Well, well, that's well, the way I feel about Botox, Nora. I feel like if I do that once, then I have to do it like every three months for the rest of my life. Well, no, I'm... you don't, actually. You can just do it once and then never do it again. Trust me, I did. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I mean, it was sort of like, okay, I did that. And then I just grew my bangs longer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that works, you know, and saved a fortune. But, but, uh, but no, it's not all of it is habit forming. It's just, it's just so amazing how much time it does take, though. We're talking to Nora Ephron. Her new book is I Feel Bad About My Neck and Other Other Thoughts on Being a Woman. It's a collection of essays that you will so enjoy no matter what age you are. It's inspirational and and yet depressing at the same time. <laughs> so thank you for writing it. Uh, Julie, you're the one that turned us on to it originally, right? Oh, I love it. Well, I, Nora, I, I heard about this. One of my friends, my I'm the oldest sister, Nora. Mm-hmm. So, my, my so friend, am I. So my friend wrote me, and she was like, run, don't walk to the bookstore to get this. And, Nora, I loved I loved your essay about how much you hate your purse. I do hate my purse. <laughs> Why? I do. Well, I'm afraid that my purse, as Louis the Fourteenth might have said, but he was too smart to have a purse, my purse, c'est moi. <laughs> you know, my purse is a disaster. My purse is the truth about me, just by the way, as as one's neck is the truth about one's age. You open up your purse, and we all know those kind of fantastically competent women who have little makeup bags with their little makeup in it, and their their money is not falling out of their wallet. Yeah. How is this possible? I don't know. My purse... It, I could I could flee the Cossacks with my purse. <laughs> I have I have you know an old airline snack left over in case I want a piece. Of Don't try to go through security with that <laughs> these days, Nora. Well, You're gonna you get know busted. this would probably get through security because it's solid as a rock. Fossilized and. I, the other day I discovered a reading lamp in my purse <laughs> and crumpled Kleenexes that you cannot tell if you've used them or you haven't used them, keys that you don't know what they open, um, little bits of tobacco, even though you haven't smoked a cigarette since long before you ever bought the purse. Right. <laughs> that is a mystery. You know, and and in the old <laughs> days, the... The, the that tampon that managed to fall out of the paper yeah. and it's just swimming around like a tadpole <laughs> and and the lipstick that the top fell off of so the little bits of lint have fallen on the lipstick and I tobacco think, I think you're using my purse Nora <laughs> well, but, sounds like and, they my contents and the stuff that oozed into it because you forgot to put the top back mm. on it um, but the thing is 
I just, I hate my purse. I can't find anything in my purse. I get depressed when I open it. And I can't stand also, by the way, this thing. Why do purses cost so much? I don't know. Yeah. Because they are so small. You can buy a couch. Because you can buy a really decent couch for what it, what some women spend on a purse. You're right. I don't understand that. And that's only getting worse. It seems like the expensive purse is the latest thing. It's just got to, we can make it. Let's just agree among let's, ourselves. Let's do it now. Well, well, I have to tell you, I highly recommend eBay. Oh. Buying purses. In fact, even the designer purse that you don't want to spend a lot of money for is very cheap on eBay. Mm-hmm. You sort of, you have to be careful because you have to buy it from a vendor who has a lot of previous sales and good recommendations, but that will help slightly. But what about evening bags? Those, they're like the size of a pillbox <laughs> and they cost $700. Not That's- that I would ever that. I just want to say that. Well, we just count on Julie. That's her traditional 40th birthday present. We're talking to Nora Ephron about her book, I Feel Bad About My Neck, but we're compiling quite a list here of things we feel bad about. Or we'll soon feel bad about as the years go on. Yeah, I just feel bad about overall elasticity, Nora, just in general as yes, a concept. Yes, but you, you mentioned earlobes. Well, that's Julie. Julie she feels sorry. bad well, about Julie, her earlobes. This is, it was a whole new, it's a whole new thing to go. I can't wait to get off the phone and look in the mirror. <laughs> And one of the most moving essays, the most moving essay in the book, I think, is Consider the Alternative, where you talk about just the stunning blow of the death of your very dear friend. Uh, Nora, it's you you call death the D word because it's all around you, but no one wants to talk about it. Well, I think one of the things I realized uh, is that, you know, this is not, I'm not the first person to say this, but it's amazing how limited our imaginations are about certain things. I certainly believe, remember believing that I was going to be the only person who never went through menopause. Right, right, <laughs> Everyone yeah. Everyone else was, but I just was this thing that was going to recede like the horizon and I was never going to quite get to it. And, and I think the same thing is true of death. We, we all don't quite believe that we're going to die. And, and that, of course, is the, that is what happens when you get older and death becomes a sniper. And you have absolutely no idea whether it's going to be um, you or your close friend or your beloved acquaintance or somebody you just kind of know. But, but almost not a week passes without one of those kind of lowered conversations where someone says, oh, have you heard about mm-hmm. so-and-so? And, and this, is, this is the sort of long shadow that hangs over you when you get to be a person of a certain age. When you're younger, we all remember those moments when you're younger where you go, oh, my God, I have a pain in my back. I'm calling the doctor. It must be, and then you make up whatever cancer you happen to think is is somewhere located near this part of your back which actually you've just pulled a muscle in or right, something you know right. but but the odds change at a certain point the odds are something is wrong with you and and that that is a gigantic change um dealing with illness and and with the fact that life becomes you have to, I think, look at your life in a way where you say, okay, I have a finite number of years. What does this mean? Now, of course, then you have no idea what it means. I will tell you one of the things it means to me, and this is going to sound so banal, but I don't mean it in a literal way. I mean it almost metaphorically, mm-hmm. which is carbohydrates. <laughs> I really... You're just going to enjoy yourself well, with the pasta. just too much good bread out there. Yeah. And I've spent a long part of my life in the zone. Right. right. And <laughs> and there is a certain point where you just go, I want that piece of bread. It's going to make me feel fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, though, it's true. You read all those studies about what you shouldn't be doing, and it, it seems like, you know, deprivation is the only way to keep yourself going for a long time. And I guess at some point you have to say, I, I've deprived myself enough. Well, it's very confusing because you don't want to get fat and unhealthy either. Right. But you do want to savor 
every single day because anything can shut down. Yeah. And it's it's just it's just dealing with that moment of realizing that you've got to you you can't I mean I love denial. Mm-hmm. I was in psychoanalysis or whatever I was in, some some voodoo thing. For, <laughs> some process. For, well, yeah, and a good process for a long time. And I learned to really be that thing called, quote, in touch with my feelings. Mm-hmm. And then I learned that just because I was in touch with my feelings didn't mean I had to sort of focus on them. Denial is not a terrible thing. And you don't want to walk around having a lot of doom and gloom, but you do have to you do have to in some way absorb the fact that this could be the day that you get the news and you want to have used enough bath oil. <laughs> <laughs> Nora Ephron, come back to Satellite Sisters anytime. Thanks for listening. You're the best. For more You're the Best Encore interviews or Satellite Sisters podcasts, go to SatelliteSisters.com or iTunes. And don't forget... Call your satellite sister. Call your satellite sister. Call your satellite sister.